Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the unveiling of the first public outdoor sculpture on our campus and the first large-scale Meniere Dawson sculpture of its kind ever. Hey. And of course, we are equally pleased that it is the latest addition to the Mason County Sculpture Trail. Let it go. It's Michigan, you know. We're, we're used to the weather. As a part of the Sculpture Trail, the college recognizes that public art matters. Sculpture is a form of civic dialogue and is the most democratic of art forms. When well done, the artwork engages us in conversations that can vary from an understanding of historical and cultural backgrounds to a connection to where we live. And it's essential to, play, to place making as well. In a world struggling to find new ways to connect, this sculpture and those which are already part of our community bring uniqueness to our civic spaces, making them more welcome and more meaningful. Meneer Dawson died 50 years ago this year, and he left a rich artistic legacy and a profound footprint on the artistic landscape of the world. And we are ex very excited to share this sculpture with the community. Meneer said, the art of all the great painters and sculptors of other times is not art of the past. It is, it is as much alive today as it ever was. Art is always of the present and continues in the present. President Scott Ward opens the unveiling program and he'll provide a welcome to the campus. Scott is serving as the college's fifth president. He has worked for the college for 10 years and has almost 30 years of experience in higher education, working at both the University of Alaska and the University of Wisconsin systems prior to coming to West Shore. I know that Scott is a strong proponent of artwork to humanize the built environment of this campus. And under Scott's leadership, I'm confident we're going to see more sculptures and artwork throughout our public speakers, uh, uh, throughout our public spaces. So it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Ward. Thank you. Welcome to this historic day at West Shore Community College. I am very fortunate to play a role in adding this sculpture to the college, building upon the legacies of the presidents before me. As President Eaton developed a new college, uh, he recognized the importance of fine and cultural arts. He hired the faculty and supported programming to build those experiences to our students and the communities. President Anderson sustained that tradition and since retirement has continued to have an important role both locally and statewide and we'll hear from him soon. Through, Do through President Dillon and his support of Professor Bloom's sabbatical, the college connection to Meneer Meneer Dawson and his family was reestablished as President Dillon led the college through the remodel of the Arts and Sciences Center, the Meneer Dawson Gallery was created. It is humbling to be in a role that enables me to build upon those legacies, the strong foundations set by the past president. Tom and I began discussing a sculpture placement over four years ago. Two years of discussion and two years of active work uh, was needed to make this reality. Yesterday I looked at a memo I wrote in January of 2015. In that memo I added these words. Through a public arts program, the college can aim to give visual and physical form to its core values, such as the pursuit of understanding, knowledge and creativity, freedom of speech and expression, respect for diverse viewers and users, and the creation of a stimulating yet safe environment. I think we will unveil the embodiment of that statement today. Through this ceremony, we will recognize and thank many of those integral in making this day happen. 
the rec recognitions given today will not go far enough or deep enough to express my sincere gratitude to so many. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank so many of you and thank you so much. I do want to recognize two people. I do want to recognize Tom for leading this effort from the inception. Two phrases come to mind when I think about Tom in this project. Unbridled enthusiasm and management by getting out of someone's way. I do not think I need to expound any further. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I also want to recognize Dr. Reamer for making this possible. As I earlier expressed my thoughts on the value of public art, we cannot forget the larger role of West Shore Community College. Our mission and vision statements include assuring student success, serving our entire community, and making our community a better place in which to learn, live, work, and prosper. Through Dr. Reamer's contributions, we have taken a giant step towards the college goals of student success and serving our community. As we celebrate this sculpture today and thank Dr. Reamer for making it possible, please join me in also recognizing him for his more important contributions through which the college will be able to better serve and support our students and serve our community. Thank you. Speaking on behalf of the Mason County Cultural Economic Development Task Force, which has oversight for the sculpture trail, is Dr. Bill Anderson, who served as the second president of the college beginning in 1983, and he retired in 1998, following a 33-year 30 30 career in higher education. In his second year, in his second career, that is, Bill was appointed as the founding director of the Michigan Department of History, Arts, and Libraries, and served under two gubernatorial administrations. Bill was the visionary for the Sculpture Park, which comprises Ludington's Waterfront Park, now a must-see destination for our visitors and a place where the community gathers. That effort has evolved into an expanded enterprise, encompassing now the entire county. Bill understands that public art is an integral part of our culture because it provides us with a deeper understanding of who we are and it provides an intersection between the past, the present, and the future. It's always a pleasure when I can introduce Dr. Bill Anderson. As we gathered, Tom made a commitment to me and that is if the wind takes my notes, he's going to track it down, there'll be a long pause. <laughs> From its beginning, the college has demonstrated the importance of art appreciation and creative artistic development. I think it's so important to be a little bit historical as we start, and that is to recognize the first full-time art instructor on this college campus, and his name was Leo Tollitz. He launched the program. He set the foundation. In addition to teaching and learning, he came up with the idea that we ought to host local artists and have them display their work in exhibitions. And part of his uh, strategy was to encourage each artist to give the college a piece of art for its permanent collection. So we early on began with a permanent collection. And it's so nifty I think today to say what's in your program and that is one of the artists that he invited was Manir Dawson and Manir Dawson was so generous in giving the college a piece of his work so that early beginning of the art program at West Shore Community College has now developed into where we are today which is really significant as the college <clears throat> grew during its 50 plus years Art instruction and attendant program also grew. And one of the factors was we got brand new facilities. And the other factor was the leadership of our professor, Rebecca Mott. Rebecca, would you wave to everybody? <laughs> the, 
this wonderful development that we are really celebrating today, and it strongly is exemplified by the Madeira Dawson Art Gallery, the growth of a permanent collection, and the seminal work of Professor Emeritus Sharon Bloom's outstanding biography of Marie of Maneer Dawson. Sharon. I think we ought to view all of this development in a larger text and I think context and I think many people would recognize that in the two central counties that make up this college district, Ludington and Manistee, if you're paying attention, they're also giving more emphasis to art in an impressive way. As was introduced in my introduction, I have the privilege of chairing the Ludington Mason County Cultural Economic Development Task Force, and we have now created six cultural trails called the Mason County uh, Cultural Trails. In terms of sculpture, which is one of those six, we began to emphasize the area of what we love, and that's Waterfront Park which for visitors and family have become, has become a destination attraction. It's where we often take people when we want to show off the community. And the first sculpture was uh, dedicated in 2001. And then we added eight more sculptures and decided that that uh, piece of real estate was finished. And why did we just arbitrarily decide that? Because in the development, we engaged the leadership of the Meyer Garden, and they came down and walked our site. And I think if we would have just been totally on our own, total amateurs, we would have put too many sculptures in that area. And they emphasize how important it is, the setting for the sculpture, uh, not just putting one sculpture on top of another uh, and making it so crowded. Well, from that beginning, we look now at the nine sculptures, that outdoor gallery at Waterfront Park as the trailhead of our Mason County Sculpture Trail. So now we've added sculptures at various places within the city, and I'm so thrilled that we're moving out into the county. And I love the fact that public art becomes a tie that binds this county together. And oftentimes the people on the eastern side of the county think that all this, the sunlight is shining on Ludington. But and what I've tried to say to everybody is that you're not going to draw the same kind of attention with one sculpture, but when you're part of 21, then it becomes a destination attraction, and I think that's what happened. And so now we have a sculpture at, at the West Michigan Fairgrounds. We have one uh, at uh, the Ludington State Park. We have one in the village of Fountain, and they are so proud of their sculpture. And when the planning is done, there will be a sculpture in both Scottville and Custer. And now on this day, we have a great new sculpture at West Shore Community College. This is a huge accomplishment for public art in our community. And I can share all of you that the members of the task force that I work with are thrilled with what's happening at the college because the college really symbolizes that art appreciation and the value of art expression. And the college's effort is going to inspire others to join this collective effort. There are two other artists that I, that I want to applaud this afternoon. The first is our great family friend, Beth Lauterbach. She has been our technical advisor, our artist scout, our advocate for so many projects and we lean on her heavenly, heavily. Beth, we are deeply appreciative of your role and your contribution to this wonderful new addition to public art. <laughs> Secondly, I want to call out Tyson Snow. Uh, Tyson, you're almost becoming an icon here in Mason County. Uh, we already have several of your sculptures. And when the village of Custer finishes their fundraising, he's going to do a fourth sculpture in Mason County. And I think you're the most popular artist we've had in County. <laughs> anyway, Tyson, it's a great privilege to work with you. We know, <laughs> we know from firsthand experience that our residents and people who visit here really feel a sense of pride when they see our public art. And I think it has a lot to do 
with the perception they have of our community. Finally, I want to conclude by people on our task force were so excited when we learned that there was an organization in the United Kingdom that was maintaining an international, listen to my words, an international directory of sculpture parks. And we are on it. We didn't petition them. We didn't ask them to. They discovered us and felt that we belonged in that kind of company. And it's not surprising that the Meyer Garden is one of our colleagues now. Congratulations to all of you who have had a role in this wonderful sculpture. We are indeed grateful. Thank you, Bill. While our primary purpose is to unveil a sculpture this afternoon, this is also an opportunity to recognize and thank the benefactor and donor who sponsored the creation, Dr. Andrew Bremer. And in a few weeks, we'll also have the opportunity to thank him again for the gift of the new Reamer Regional Public Safety Training Center. The college would not be the college that it is today without you and the generous gifts that you've provided. You have made a difference in the lives of our students. Every day, your contributions are changing lives and making our region a better place in which to live, learn, work, and prosper. And now some background on Dr. Reamer. He's a hometown boy. He is a 1979 Ludington High School graduate and attended Ferris State University, where, he, where in 1984 he earned his Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy. After working for two years as a pharmacist in Ludington, he decided medical school was his calling, where he graduated at the top of his class and completed an internship at the Ingham Reg Regional Medical Center in Lansing. From 1991 to 1994, he completed his ophthalmology residency at Michigan State University. Go green! <laughs> and then returned to Ludington to open the Reamer Eye Center downtown in front of the Stearns Hotel. He relocated the office to Lawndale Street near the hospital, and his practice saw a large expansion of its optical center earlier this year. He also has offices in Shelby, Manistee, and Cadillac. And notably, you'll see that Dr. Reamer is in great physical shape. Earlier this month, he completed his 34th full Ironman triathlon. That's remarkable. Once again, let's show our appreciation for his generous, uh, generous philanthropy to the college and to community. quite an introduction. I want to meet that guy. <laughs> um, my motives for supporting could be a little bit self-serving. I've had six adult kids go through these doors at this campus and I'm doing the math as they're speaking because they, they went on to, uh, uh, I have three doctors, two lawyers and a grad student. Um, she's at Iowa, we'll forgive her for that, but um, uh, I'm doing the math and thinking it's a little self-serving because I'm thinking of all the college tuition I saved. <laughs> all those years that they went through here starting out their careers and to go on, and, and so this is their, their stepping point, but it also bought a couple of years of college that, that dad didn't have to fund, so I'm appreciative for that. Um, I'm out of my context a little bit being here because I'm I'm in the science realm, and this is way different than what we have here. And uh, I, I did some research when I was asked um, uh, to uh, help contribute here, and it was that, that, that offer was presented to me, and I, I had to stop and think, because it, it's out of my realm. And I, I, did some, I did some literature research, and I really discovered that, that uh, appreciation for art and creativity facilitate and lead to intelligence. And I go, this is a good thing. I'm, <laughs> You know, I'm also looking here, even at this plaza, and I'm thinking, we can put this here, and we have all these bricks, and every one of these bricks can be, uh, have a name on it, and with a donation of $100 or so, then we can fill this up, and the college then continues to uh, benefit further and further as we go. Uh, um, in my life, I've been blessed in so many ways, and so people here do things, and, and I help them facilitate them doing them because I've been honored and blessed to, 
to be able to have resources to do that. I, I thank God for that, and he, he put me here to just enable good people to do good work. Thank you very much. Now you get to meet artist Tyson Snow, who played a key role in the replication of this bronze sculpture that we will unveil soon. We are pleased that he's joining us today. His full talent and skill as an, artistic, as an artist is certainly evident, for I think he has truly captured Veneer's vision in this piece. As you will read in the commemorative booklet, Tyson discovered the original artwork contained no straight lines, a situation that undoubtedly presented him with many challenges. A situation um, that he faced in an undaunted sort of way. He closely examined the piece to discover an organic form with subtle curves and arcs and willingly took up the challenge and we're really grateful that you did. Tyson started showing his artwork in 2004 in Scottsdale, Arizona. He had instant success which brought a growing public interest in his work. He has since been active in several large-scale bronze public works. Currently, Tyson has been hand-selected to assist in producing the World War I Memorial for Washington, D.C.'s Mall District. Tyson has also been accepted into museum and juried art exhibitions where he has been the recipient of first place honors uh, and uh, merit awards and purchase awards for many of his paintings and his sculptures. This is not his first visit to the area. As Bill mentioned earlier, he's created two other sculpture trail pieces, including Making Memories uh, in Rotary Park and the Great Lakes Schooner Bronze in Waterfront Park. Let's welcome Tyson and express our appreciation for the artistry of Tyson Snow. Thank you very much. Um, it is a pleasure. I love this area. I'm glad that I'm back. Unfortunately, I'm not able to stay for very long this time. Hopefully, I come back again and spend some time. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure for me to take part in this uh, magnificent installation. I'd like to publicly thank Tom, uh, Tom Holly, and uh, President Scott Ward and his associates, and uh, Dr. Reamer for his amazing contributions. Um, I think it's already evident that this could not have taken place without, without them. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the community for continuing to have me back, for trusting me um, to, to, uh, to do this. I'm, I'm kind of an, out, I'm an outsider. Um, uh, also, special thanks goes to uh, Beth Lauterbach of Scottsdale Fine Art and Bill Anderson. Um, they have put immense trust in me to take on these projects, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, I was going to mention some of the things that I've done in, in, in the past and that's already been mentioned so there's no need for me to do so. <laughs> but if you're taking into consideration fire monuments and monuments in Washington, D.C., the types of monuments you see there are typically figurative. They're human beings, it's representational art. And so this project is a step away from that. And so when Beth approached me about this project, I was a little unsure about taking it on. I do appreciate uh, non-representational work, and I've done some of it, but it's been a long time. Um, however, what I found was, as soon as I started on this project, um, there was, uh, let me just find myself here. It uh, strangely felt familiar to me. It's hard to explain. But as an artist, we deal a lot with emotion, and especially with non-representational art, there's a lot of power and emotion that's uh, charged within these pieces that are not necessarily representational. Um, it had a presence. And um, as with the human body, because again, that's my expertise, I, I excel in figurative sculpture. And what I found with this, working on this, was that um, Minir Dawson's sculpture has no flat planes, as was mentioned. It's comprised of complex, concave and convex arch, uh, arches and bulging curves running in every direction. Um, I, it's, it's, I don't know if I can explain that. You, you'll see it when you see the piece. There's 
everything is falling away from something else. There, there's no, uh, it's very much like the human body in that way. Um, it is both architectural and organic, much like the body. So while working on this, I remember thinking, I know the human figure, I, knew, I know the form. This feels very much like a, a figure. Only later would I, would I learn Lanier Dawson's intentions was uh, for this non-representational piece was to represent a figure from Greek myth. Also later I learned from an interviewer that he owned and cared for a, uh, a fruit tree orchard, which inspired his works. I, I, can't, I can't begin to tell you how impactful that was for me on many levels. Um, from time immemorial, trees have been used as a symbol to represent people and the human family. The symbol of trees with edible fruit runs deep and is something that, ha that I myself have, have represented in many of my own artworks. I have a whole series of figures with trees and fruit. And um, so this really struck me. I felt a great connection with this piece before I even realized what the artist's intentions were for it. Um, which was incredible for me to find, to find out the feelings that I had the, about the piece rang true when I came to realize what it was that the artist was doing and how, what, his, um, what his inspirations were. In order to um, honor this wonderful man, I worked very hard to stay true to his original vision and emotion. Um, keep in mind the original piece is three feet tall and made of a completely different material. It's a composite wood. And so to, um, to replicate that and the texture of it, to have it read and feel like the same piece, but on a much larger scale, create, created some challenges. Um, when I created Monument, I'm typically always involved with the design, design aspect of it. And of course, with this one, I was not. So being able to replicate an existing work to honor such an artist was an absolute pleasure for me. Um, thank you. The next speaker we credit with getting the college very focused on the importance of recognizing Manir Dawson as one of our own. Sharon Bloom was a professor of communications at the college for over 20 years and she became interested in Dawson when she moved into the Dawson's family home called The Humps, south of Ludington. What she did not know when she moved in in 1977 was that the house was the childhood summer home of Manir Dawson. Nor did she know that in the next three decades she would be intimately, she would uh, get to intimately know Manir, even though he died in 1969. But Manir's spirit had more in store for Professor Bloom. Her interest in the artist and her connection to the family inspired her to tell his story, and she was granted a sabbatical by the college's board of trustees so she could research Dawson in greater detail. A book, as you heard about earlier, Manir Dawson, Inventions of the Mind, was a culmination of Sharon's sabbatical years and her years of research. In 2013, the Historical Society of Michigan honored Sharon with the State History Award for her scholarship, the highest recognition given by the state's historical society. But her passion to tell Manier's story didn't end with a book. In 2010, an art gallery was proposed to be added to the Arts and Sciences Center, and when it underwent an extensive renovation, she proposed submitting uh, the name Manier Dawson Gallery to the Board of Trustees to honor and recognize the legacy of a prominent Mason County resident and American artist. Since the publication of the book, she has delivered over 50 lectures around the state about Manier Dawson. It has been Sharon's intense interest, scholarship, and advocacy to tell Manier's story that has brought us to this moment. It is with great pride that I introduce a former colleague Sharon Bloom. What an exciting event. And thank you for that nice introduction. Um, it may have come as a surprise to some of you when you first heard that America's art pioneer 
was a fruit farmer right here in Mason County. Uh, Meneer Dawson is considered to be the first in America to produce non-representational abstractions. And by non-representational, I mean that in these abstractions, you cannot make out anything from the natural world. You can't see a person or a landscape. They were inventions of the mind. He produced these first paintings for the modern world in 1910, and they were revolutionary. In fact, because they were so new and different, they really challenged the viewer's preconceived ideas of art. And most thought them disgusting, um, crazy. Some even got very, very angry. You know, you can't call that art. What do you think you're doing? That You can't do that. Like, I first heard of the name Meneer Dawson in 1977 when I purchased the Dawson family vacation home, as Tom just said. I hadn't lived there long before somebody asked me if I was a relative of the artist, if I knew the um, artist or knew the family. And they said that Meneer had uh, pieces of art in different uh, prestigious museums around the country. Well, I knew nothing about that at the time, but I have a real love of history, so I began to research. And as I did, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I put things you know, in a black notebook and just kept building on that. And then in the year 2000, two of Dawson's grandsons drove up my driveway looking for their ancestral home. They weren't sure if it was still standing yet because it had been a number of years, like 1960, so it was about 40 years since they had been there. And they drove up and we became immediate friends. I invited them in and we talked and um, they began then sharing more information that they had and they um, even shared their grandfather's and great-grandfather's journals with me and they were invaluable in my writing of my book. They began to invite my daughters and me to attend uh, Dawson exhibitions around the country and we met even more Dawson family members. We traveled several times to exhibitions in New York City and Chicago and another one in Terre Haute, Indiana. Yet most in Dawson's own hometown still knew very little about the artist or even recognized his name. I began to feel like something needed to be done to acknowledge his legacy here in Ludington. About the same time, I received an invitation to a Dawson exhibition from a gallery in Chicago. The invite claimed to be bringing Dawson home. And that just really bothered me. After all, this was Dawson's home. This is where he spent most of his life. So in January 2003, I wrote Dr. Anderson a letter. I'm not sure if you remember this, Bill. <laughs> But at this time, Dr. Anderson had retired as president of West Shore Community College, and he was then the director of the Michigan Department of History, Arts, and Libraries. I had read in the Ludington Daily News that he was touring the, school, uh, the state with a group of people recognizing different historical events, places, and individuals in Michigan towns, and that he had been to Ludington, but there was no mention of Dawson. I, um, I wrote in my very impassioned letter of Dawson's accomplishment and tried to convince Dr. Anderson that Dawson should be recognized among Ludington's important historical figures. I wrote that it was true that Dawson was born in Chicago and that he lived here in his early years. However, and they lived there in his early years. However, he was connected to Northern Michigan his entire life. In the 1890s, when most tourists bypassed our noisy, kind of dirty lumber town with sawmills along the lake shore, a roommate of Meneer's father from the University of Michigan, Charles Wing, and many of you are probably familiar with that name, he convinced George Sr. to bring his family to the Ludington Lake Shore. And the Dawsons are recorded in the Mason County History Book as Ludington's first summer resorters. Then in 1903, when the Dawson boys were in their teens, the family purchased a farm within the hills of Riverton Township. And this is the place that I now live. Every year during the boys' youth, the family took the ferry from Chicago to Ludington and stayed on the farm that they called the Humps during the summer months. Here, Meneer learned fruit farming and engineering skills, all the time eagerly practicing his art, using any materials that he could find on the farm. Some of his earliest recorded paintings were on cedar shakes from the Cartier sawmill that the family was using for farm repairs. 
and four, and they're just small cedar shakes, and four of these are hanging in the gallery today, and you may want to stop and see them. The farm stayed in this, in this family, in the Dawson family, for 77 years until I purchased it. I went on to, to say that when Dawson was 26, he purchased the adjoining property on South Edge of the fi family farm, and they named the farm South Edge, and here he began fruit farming. He wanted a livelihood that would allow him to follow his artistic passions and realize he was always happiest in the humps in the, close to Lake Michigan. Here he thrived on the physical labor of the farm and even wrote about that in his journal and, he, and the creativity that he gained from the natural area. Muneer felt fruit farming would be a perfect fit for him because he could work the summer months in the orchards and make a living and then spend all winter creating art. Michigan's natural beauty fed his creative spirit. He and his wife, a local girl, Lillian Booker, raised three children at South Edge and they called it home for 55 years. In addition, much of Menu's work was inspired by the local area. The beautiful colors of the Lake Michigan sunsets, the roses, the pinks, the peaches, uh, the yellows, the creams, became predominant in many of Meniere's abstractions. In fact, on the farm, the first room a visitor entered was called the Sunset Room, and Meniere painted it from top to bottom with colors of the sunset. Dawson also began producing sculptures once he moved to the farm. He found that sculptures were easier to work on than paintings because he liked to sculpt at the dining room table, and so he could just leave them and go out and do the chores. It was a time when you were still feeding horses and putting wood in the wood stove, so he could just leave that and go do whatever it was that he needed to do, whereas with painting, the oils would dry up and he'd have to wash the brushes or whatever, so um, sculpting became much better for him there. As he spent hours in the long, in the top, hours in the tops of trees trimming branches, he had inspirations for many of his sculptures, perhaps even this one here today. He often would go on the tops of the trees and then he would start, when he got home, he would sketch and then later implement that, that sculpture. So in this letter I sent to Dr. Anderson, I politely reminded him that Ludington was Dawson's hometown and Dawson should be recognized here. And Bill responded as a true administrator and he said, you really need to do something about that, Sharon. <laughs> but then he gave me some very sound advice. He said that to get Dawson the recognition he deserves to start small, maybe do something at West Shore Community College, because that's where I was and that's something I knew about, or in, and perhaps involve the family, because they're often receptive to doing something like this. Well, I thought about that, and I wasn't yet I didn't know the family well enough to be comfortable with asking for anything, so I went to President Dillon for the first time trying to convince him that we needed a Dawson Art Gallery here on campus, and he thanked me and kind of waved goodbye as I was going out the door. But then about eight years later, I saw that the art gallery here, was an art gallery was being included in the arts and science building renovation. This time I was much more prepared and I included family, as Dr. Anderson had suggested. And this time when I went to President Dillon, he listened and the Meniere Dawson Gallery became a reality with the help of Peter Lockwood, who you're gonna hear in just a minute, and his donation of a very significant piece of art from 1910 called House at Bridge. And what a treasure the gallery has become. Meniere Dawson himself donated the very first piece before we really had a place to honor it in 1969 and as I just stated, Peter Lockwood then donated House at Bridge in 2010, and then in 2012, he um, donated another piece called Untitled Abstraction. Several years ago, a Riverton fruit farmer, Reginald Yapel, who had worked with Meniere when he was young, and who gave me some wonderful information um, in my book, donated a beautiful sculpture, Acrobats, through this state, his estate upon his death. And this year alone, the gallery has received six new pieces of Dawson's work. And we have three of them hanging today, but three more are coming. And that is wonderful. <laughs> this 
works were donated by Mayor Barstow, the co-author of the Meniere Dawson catalog resume. And she had studied Dawson and collected um, his art for years. And she was also very helpful to me when I, I wrote my book. And she's also been very instrumental here with the sculpture. With these donations, 10 in all, West Shore Community College has the largest collection of Meniere Dawson's work in the entire state of Michigan. And that is really good. And now we have the beautiful bronze sculpture, Dado, that we are here to celebrate. It is a reproduction of a sculpture by the same name, executed in 1958. Although Dawson hated to name his pieces, because he felt that if he did, that's what people would look for in the painting. So if he named something a non-representational two trees, everybody is like looking, where are those trees? You know, in fact, they're going upside down. So he did not like to name his pieces, because as I said, they were inventions of the mind. However, with Dado, there does seem to be some significance in the name. Art historian Dr. Randy Plo, the other co-author of the Dawson Catalog Resume, wrote about Dawson's attraction to the Greek myth of Daedalus. And Daedalus, the character of the myth, was an architect, an engineer, and an artist, just like Dawson. And they shared another point in common. Like Daedalus in the story, Dawson's only son, Gerard, who grew up here and attended Ludington High School, died by falling from the sky. In June 1942, Lieutenant Gerald Dawson, a pilot in World War II, died when his plane crashed in Panama. He was the first announced casualty of war in Mason County, and his name is recorded on the memorial in front of the courthouse. If Dawson had his son in mind when he originally created this piece, it makes it even more significant for it to be here in Mason County. So today, because of Tom Hawley's leadership, Dr. Andrew Reamer's generous donation, and Tyson Snow's expertise, we are celebrating the bronze reproduction of Dado here on campus. And there couldn't be a better location to showcase Dawson's artwork. Good thing I'm wrapping this up, right? We're gonna get rain done. <laughs> They're telling me something. I think we all have a new appreciation of Meniere Dawson's creative passion and artistic vision as we pay tribute to this revolutionary artist. Our students will definitely learn about this art pioneer and study his work in their art appreciation classes. And although we are honoring Meniere Dawson today, I feel he has honored us threefold through his artwork. His life and work are an inspiration to us all. Thank you. Our final speaker comes to this event from Arlington, Texas, and his claim to fame when he travels to this part of Michigan is that he is Meniere Dawson's grandson. Several of Meniere's family have also joined us today, and I'd like them to stand so we can recognize you. Please stand, Meniere Dawson's family. Throughout his life, Peter has worked to preserve his grandfather's artistic legacy. And the, the pieces of work, uh, the two artworks that, that uh, Sharon spoke of, uh, provided a firm foundation of Meniere's artwork to help establish him as America's first abstract artist. And Peter, we're grateful for those, uh, for those paintings on our campus. We're grateful for your generosity and for trusting us to care for those artworks. So speaking on behalf of those who have traveled and all of the descendants of Minear Dawson, Peter Lockwood. Thank you. Now, I'm from Texas. I didn't know I was getting to get sunburned. <laughs> uh, there are two great grandsons of Minear Dawson here today, Christopher Lockwood and Martin Dawson. There were other great grandchildren that wanted to be here, but uh, their schedule and travels from the West Coast with the three hour time delay, with school just starting, was very difficult. My brothers and I began visiting this area in the 1950s, and uh, more specifically the South Edge farm that uh, our grandfather owned. He bought that in 1914. When we were old enough, our grandfather put us to work on the farm, cutting 
sumac, sinking boulders, picking cherries. Um, we got a, a good taste of uh, Ludington life. Um, of course, he paid us a dollar twenty-five an hour back then. Which at first, we thought it was a lot of money, about fifty bucks a week. Then we found out he was going to take out twenty-eight dollars for a room and board. <laughs> But that taught us the value of a dollar. And, uh, I believe that's one reason I was successful in business over the years. I was 19 years old when my grandfather died. Uh, I was lucky enough to sit with him in Sarasota, Florida in 1969 and see the first man step on the moon. Uh, he died approximately a month later. But uh, that's a, a very special memory for him. When I was young, I always knew that my grandfather's artwork was, that he was creating was very, very special. We always had a few pieces hanging in the house when I was growing up. I also viewed a lot of his sculptures and paintings at the South Edge Farm in Riverton Township. I'd look at them and, and think, that looks neat, but what is it? It's weird. Uh, it was later that I realized he created shapes and, and forms with spatial relations, which came from his mind and didn't come from nature or natural forms. His non-representational abstract paintings were not copies of anything. They were inventions of his mind. And that is expertly explained uh, by Sharon Bloom in her book, Inventions of the Mind. Without Sharon's compelling curiosity, determination, and research, probably none of what is happening today would be happening here in Michigan as related to my grandfather. And I would like to thank her. <laughs> Maneer Dawson was not an eccentric artist, well, not too eccentric, anymore, <laughs> as compared to some of the other artists of the time. Um, he didn't think about cutting off his ear like Van Gogh did. Um, he didn't have a whole bunch of mistresses like Picasso did. He got married here in Ludington, uh, Riverton Township, uh, became a fruit farmer and raised a family. He's still apparently considered by many art historians as an anomaly. They, they're still trying to figure out where in the heck he came from. And they wonder how could it, he have created such unique early abstract art of this astounding form without being exposed to the other great artists of the time, which he, it's been proven that he wasn't. Uh, Randy Plogue, who Sharon mentioned, uh, professor of art, and art history at the College of Arts and Architecture at Penn State University, who accomplished his dissertation on Maneer Dawson in 1994, has since explained the most sensible way that my grandfather came to, to create these uh, creations. Uh, he did a lecture at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2012 entitled uh, Picasso and Maneer Dawson, Separate Paths to Similar Destinations. Uh, it explains his findings and conclusions. So if you take the time to Google Picasso and Maneer Dawson together, you can view and listen to this lecture. Um, I personally thank Professor Plogue for his work, research, and diligence related to Maneer Dawson. <laughs> this is a Incredible monument, excuse me. My grandfather would be very pleased and humbled and honored by this dedication of one of his creations. I would like to sincerely thank West Shore Community College, its board of trustees, <coughs> President Scott Ward, and also Tom Hawley for his excellent work and promotion and exceptional project management for this undertaking. And I'm sure Tasha Dalt was a great 
help with this amendment. Mm -hmm. I, almost, I also must give my warmest thanks to my dear friend Myra Bearstow for help and generosity made this entire situation possible. I also give thanks for the knowledge and expertise provided by Beth Lauterbach and the fantastic work accomplished by Tyson Snow and I think I'm going to see Nathan Bennett's Amazing their work in creating this bronze public. Also, finally, a special thanks goes out to Dr. Reimer for his donation gift to the college foundation that funded this incredible monument. On my grandfather's behalf, I thank everybody. Thank you. Now it's getting time to unveil this sculpture. I want to also recognize a few people. I want to recognize architect Tom Matheson and his firm for the outstanding design of the, of the uh, plaza and the pedestal. Tom, right in front here, stand up. And Emily too, come on Emily. She had a hand in it. The Christman Company and Dan Lamore, which oversaw the construction of the plaza and Larson's Landscaping, who implemented much of this design. I also want to recognize another person who's already been recognized today, um, Beth Lauterbach. Would you please come forward? She's been sitting in front here, and we've been talking about her the whole time. You can read more about uh, her role in the commemorative booklet but I want to add that Beth's confident direction and professionalism is unlike any other I've ever had the opportunity to work with. And I'm grateful for her extensive expertise throughout the entire sculpture production process. Her artistic guidance and presence made my coordinating role much, much easier. So thank you. You step up here because we're going to get ready to unveil it. I want you to be up here when we do it. Uh, it's time to unveil the sculpture. And I'm going to ask Dr. Reamer and Tyson Snow to do the honors. So if you'll come over to the bottom of the sculpture, we'll get this thing undone. And I hope this cover comes off. <laughs> Okay, just a few announcements before we conclude. We sincerely hope that you'll join us for reception inside the Shainer Campus Center and enjoy some refreshments on this rather warm late summer day. And be sure to step inside the bookstore, which has undergone a complete renovation over the summer months. Also inside, you'll see a time capsule, which is going to be buried near the Sculpture Plaza in the next few weeks. A copy of this program and hopefully a copy of the video will be in it, and it'll be interesting to see what people say 50 years from now at the centennial of this institution, what happened here today. So many thanks to the Student Senate for their support of that project. You'll also find some copies. This is some shameless promotion, but I got to do it, of Sharon Bloom's book, Meneer Dawson, Inventions of the Mind, and I'm sure she'll make herself available to personally autograph a copy for you. We also uh, want you to leave time to step into the Meneer Dawson Gallery. It's open in the Arts and Sciences Center, this building right over here, to view the exhibition of Meneer's work, which is from the college's collection and were donated by the artist himself, his family, and other private donors. 
Four of the exhibited pieces are recent acquisitions and are being displayed for the first time in the gallery. Uh, Professor of Art Eden Foley, who's right in the back here, will be in the gallery to answer any of your questions. Dr. Reamer stated earlier, personalized engraved, grip, engraved bricks are available. Uh, we'll have information in, inside about if you want to add your name to the names that are already here. Each brick uh, sold raises support for our scholarship endowment fund within the college's foundation. And uh, this is your opportunity to really make a difference. Every gift matters. More information, again, is available in the bookstore. We appreciate the fact that you were all here today to join us for this very special event. And thank you again. Enjoy your day on the campus.